Hello and welcome to Dialogue. China has unveiled what's called the most aggressive stimulus to arrest economic slowdown with pledges on fiscal spending and the goals of stabilizing the property market. What are the specific moves? What more stimulus policies will be released to boost economic growth? And how will those steps help the Chinese economy cope with the challenges? Join us for our discussion today from Beijing. I'm Xu Qianduo. Joining me today are Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics, Yan Liang, Kramer Chair Professor of Economics at William Matt University, Professor Radhika Desai from the Department of Political Studies in the University of Manitoba, and Dario Gape, CEO of GabyTraders.com. Welcome to Dialogue. So, Bao Chen, I will start with you. Uh, you know, like, what is your major takeaway from this uh, top economic meeting chaired by President Xi Jinping uh, this Thursday? I think it's a very uh, realistic and also holistic assessment of where we are in terms of uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, management and performance. Uh, it touches upon the major drivers to grow the economy in terms of the consumption. Uh, or export, uh, invitation of foreign investments and uh, employment, and particularly the structural issues that is going on, and with more focus on boosting the uh, property market, uh, which is very crucial to shore up the Chinese economy and also to continue to feed uh, to the cash drain of many of the local governments. And uh, another uh, one is really how to uh, boost the critical sectors of uh, our employment, particularly the graduates and migrating workers, et cetera. Uh, but I, one thing I do not very much agree is that it's just not really the most aggressive, uh, the stimulus package. I think it's more of a comprehensive package as to sharp the economy. Is, uh, uh, therefore, it is not really focused on the cash uh, injection or liquidity injection into the marketplace. And uh, and now when China is getting uh, engaged in an uphill battle, we face a number of challenges. And so therefore we do need to to devise a more holistic approach and a a more comprehensive uh, measures uh, to address the sophisticated issues instead of uh, as what we did uh, simply to pour money into the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Yan Liang, uh, obviously, maybe it's not the stimulus package in terms of um, you know specific amount of uh, like money involved, but there are, as uh, Bolton pointed out, you know, comprehensive uh, policy support. I mean, probably the signal. Right, I agree. I think you know this stimulus package is not just a sort of one-time shot. Right, like some of the Western media would call the bazooka. Um, that sounds very sort of one time and it's a very untargeted stimulus. But I think the stimulus is actually very premeditated, it's very targeted. And also um, it goes from you know monetary policy, financial policies to support the liquidity, to support the housing market and the stock market, to trying to strengthen you know um, fiscal front and fiscal support, especially in this uh, central committee meeting. They talked about to better use utilize the special uh, issue uh, special purpose is, uh, issuance of bonds um, to leverage on the government's role in the economy. And also, it talked about how to promote employment, as well as how to promote a better environment for private sectors, as well as foreign capital to invest. So I agree. I think it's a very comprehensive and double down on some of the you know, necessary measures to help with certain markets. But also, I think in a way, it helps with the long-term structural you know, development of the economy when it comes to, for example, mortgage rate cuts. Um, that would help to boost consumption. Uh, it estimated that... 30 million households will, you know, uh, will reduce the amount of payments by 150 billion yuan. So this is extra cash to support the discretionary spending. Um, the, 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 the booster of the, you know, stock market, I think, is also could help to create some more, you know, positive wealth effect to help to stimulate, you know, internal domestic demand. So I agree. I, I think these are not just sort of the blind uh, stimulus packages, 
um, but it does, you know, go with the easing cycle of the central banks around the world and double down on fiscal measures and other more structural measures um, to really help the economy, not just in the short term, but in the medium and long term. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Radhika, so it's not only uh, aiming at uh, solving challenges, uh, you know, immediate challenges in short term term, I mean, short term uh, probably for the Chinese economy, but also it's a long term structural uh, issue to solve that kind of challenge to ensure a long term sustainable economic growth. Sure. I mean, I think that, first of all, as, as we saw in the third plenum, the Chinese economy is looking to, uh, uh, to effect is really a kind of a major reorientation towards the new productive forces and new types of industries and technological investments and so on. So the government is taking uh, the measures for doing that. So the, the role of this package, I think, has simply been to stabilize matters, as the two other speakers have pointed out. They are essentially providing a little boost here, you know, whether it is certain categories of workers or the property market or the share market. So the in the West, really, everybody expects that there's like, as, as, as uh, uh, Yang Liang pointed out, the West expects that there's going to be some big bazooka but in reality it has been a very measured program and also there are a number of other western assumptions that are upended so one is that uh, they especially when just the monetary measures were rolled out a lot of the western commentators said oh this is not enough to boost the economy but the fact is that was they were not meant to boost the economy. They were meant merely to stabilize asset prices, particularly in the stock market and in the property market, in the real estate property market. And what was very interesting as well is that, yes, it did boost, for example, the stock market. But if you look at certain uh, indices like the Shanghai Composite or whatever, they did not go very up. They essentially stabilized at a sort of medium level. If you look at it from a long term point of view, there were much higher peaks before uh, during the during the boom times. So they are not looking to spike the asset markets. And unfortunately, in the West, the role of monetary policy has in fact been to uh, create asset bubbles. And that is definitely not the sort of thing we are seeing in China. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dario, obviously, I, I think, you know, Radhika mentioned this very interesting point, the Chinese purpose of this latest round of uh, economic measures. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, trying to lift you know, the prices or creating uh, like asset bubble, uh, especially for the property market. Uh, Instead, the key word, you know, many Chinese press would read is like uh, to stabilize the property market, the real estate uh, market, you know, not creating uh, basically more, uh, um, you know, new uh, group of uh, or uh, new uh, uh, properties or new land uh, for the use of a property development. Uh, instead, it's about uh, consumption of the existing, uh, you know, homes uh, and stabilize uh, the market. Uh, so what, what's your understanding? It seems there's a you know, probably like a, a misunderstanding sometimes over there? Oh, the West often misunderstands what's happening in China. There's no question about that. But what's happened here is that it's given a, a dramatic boost to consumer confidence, to domestic consumption, and that's part of the aim of these objectives. It's also increased the attractiveness in terms of foreign investment coming into China. But I think it's important to recognise that these announcements are consistent with the outlines that were put in place with the third plenum. So what we've got is we've got some flesh on the bones of what happened in the third plenum. So it's not new reforms, it's not going in new directions, it's initiating and enabling the reforms that were already in place prior to the third plenum and which President C has committed to continuing steadily on that reform path. So it's consistent with overall policy, it's improved the confidence quite dramatically in terms of the investment community. You see that in the Shanghai Index, and I'm sure that we'll see that coming into Golden Week as well, with a further boost to confidence in terms of consumer spending. Yeah, we have seen the People's Bank of China uh, basically cutting interest rates uh, for uh, you know the existing home loans. Uh, well, yeah, now of course the reduction of this. Uh, uh, existing home loans, of, um, I mean, with the purpose of reducing the burden on those who invested in the property market, but now it's really to encourage people uh, to invest, uh, I mean, especially for those who, want, who need uh, you know, a place to, to live in. 
and so called in Chinese gang xu, right? And uh, it's the time. Is it the time for them? And uh, you know to put down the, the payment and to purchase um, you know invest a long term home for themselves. Of course, you still see the restrictions on the uh, speculation, speculative investment in the property market. Uh, uh, so, what are the factors do you think people are, are, are looking for, or, are, or what um, policies are they you know expecting uh, expecting from the government? Right. So I think to encourage people、um, buying houses for their own residency, one thing is、uh, we need to ensure people have the steady jobs and income. And on the other hand, we need to make sure that the property market prices are stabilized. So no one wants to buy houses if they believe the housing price is going to continue to go down. So, and I believe, I really truly believe that you know the Chinese government has done really something tremendous and very remarkable. This idea of we have a controlled、uh, demolition of this housing bubble, I think, is very important.、Uh, on the one hand, it really helps housing is not for speculation,、um, but really for people to live in.、Uh, on the other hand, I think it's also very important to lower the prices of the housing market so then people can actually afford the houses. And so I think this,、uh, you know, housing market recorrection is very important. And I think China has done a great job when it comes to, you know, controlling the damages when you compare to, you know, the housing prices in Japan and in the United States. I think China is really doing a remarkable job. Now that said, there are collateral damages, right? When the housing market values down and when 70% of households' wealth is tied to the housing market.、Uh, Inevitably, people will feel that negative house,、uh, the negative wealth impact, and they would not want to buy houses. They would not want to spend. So I think it's important to lower the mortgage rates and lower also the down payments uh, uh, on these houses,、um, and to stimulate you know the consumption side. But I think more importantly, we have already seen government、uh, roll out policies to finish some of the unfinished apartments and ensure the delivery of the houses that people already pay,、uh, you know, ahead of time. And on the other hand, I think another big problem here is the inventory. So we still have a lot of housing inventory、uh, that needs to be resolved. And I think this is very important because these houses already built. And like、uh, Professor Liu said, you know, if we leave them empty, this is a huge resources waste. And at the same time, we still have people who need a house. So I think that's why the government has been setting up all these funds, allowed banks and also local governments to tap into this central bank liquidity in order to buy some of these、uh, houses for social housing. Now, one of the difficulty, of course, is because the local governments now are quite cash、uh, trapped. Strapped.、Um, they're also taking on a lot, of,、uh, a lot of debt, and therefore, I think it's very important、um, to continue to resolve the local government debt issues. So then, local governments will have more incentives and also more financial, you know, and, and power to be able to buy back, you know, some of these inventories.、Um, it's very well noted that, you know, back in、uh, May, the central government has ordered twenty,、uh, sorry, two hundred cities、uh, to purchase some of the housing inventory. But three months later, only twenty nine cities were actually、uh, were actually able to do that. So I think that just shows、uh, we need to give more support to the local governments, and they, and that would really help to stabilize the housing market by providing you know more social housing and stabilize the floor、um, and, and you know get rid of the excess inventories.、Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Radhika, you know, property market for any market, I mean, any country is you know at certain times it's a headache. You know, like、uh, young people need to find a place to live in, but often they complain the prices、uh, they are too high. But in the Chinese case, you know, the Chinese government basically、uh, took took the initiative, you know, to squeeze the bubble.、Uh, you know, <laughs> that's the initiative from the government instead of like a pressure from the market, etc. Of course, as Liang Yan said, there are collateral damages, there are challenges.、Uh, where are we now? I mean,、uh, it's a control matter. It's for, it's for a few years now, and now the government,、uh, the the purpose is very clear. That is, stabilize the market. At the same time, they want to provide enough. Uh, houses for the people who need them, but the, but it's not a speculative market. Exactly. I mean, the approach that the Chinese government has taken is that could not be form a greater contrast with the approach taken in the West. So, first of all, the nature of the property bubble as it occurred were two very different things. In China, the people who were indebted, the entities that were indebted, were the development companies. Whereas in the in the West, it was the most indebted people were the banks and of course the、um, the the people who were taking out mortgages, and in the end, in two thousand and eight, the 
matter was resolved in favor of the financial institutions and not in favor of the people who own the homes. In China, the entire emphasis is on completing the homes, on ensuring that their prices are stabilized because people's savings are in there, saving the actual people who live in there, not just the financial institution. The financial institutions, of course, get get saved because they are systemically important. But the point is that the emphasis has been on the end consumer, on the owners of the houses. So I think that the way in which this has been resolved is, is completely the opposite of what was done. And I agree with you that the, uh, whereas in the West, you know, after 2008, the way in which the uh, central banks, particularly the Federal Reserve, continued to support asset price increases has meant that we are once again in a property bubble. Of course, we are in an everything bubble, as they say. So there is every type of asset price is in bubble territory in Western countries, whereas this is not so in China. China has a completely different financial structure. They are not in the business of inflating bubbles. They do not think that bubbles are the main engine with which to create economic growth. No. Chinese growth is basically reliant on uh, a combination of government and private initiative, and this continues to be the case. And that's why the fiscal measures that were rolled out, and and uh, Yan Yang and Professor Liu also have said, uh, uh, you know, that these fiscal measures are uh, uh, directed towards particular local difficulties in the growth. One of the things we have to remember is that this part of the reason this is not some big bazooka is that the problem is not very big. The problem is just of essentially ensuring that the small deficit that was expected in the achievement of the growth rate will not in fact, be a deficit that the growth rate will be achieved. So it is a small adjustment. It's not big. So in both of those uh, instances, and remember, Chinese growth, even at 5%, will still be almost twice as much as U.S. growth and many times more the growth in most other Western countries. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dario, uh, if you look at the stock market, because of the news, because of the record, of course, I think because of the change of the attitudes everybody can see from the central government is all about the economy now. You do see there's a strong surge. And of course, uh, there are responses also from overseas, like the billionaire uh, investor David Tepper says, you know, everything in China, to, everything to buy in China now, you know, uh, ETF and futures. They had talked about, uh, you know, purchasing uh, the China related to those stuff. So uh, your opinion, so it's a time to invest in China? The time to invest in China was in the last two or three months. But typically with the Western fund managers, they wait until the market actually begins to move. But yes, it is a good time to invest. We've seen more than a 10% rise over the last couple of days. This is good, but it's unsustainable. There will be some pullback that develops, but the rebound will deliver steady momentum. The surge reflects confidence that the measures that have been taken are appropriate and that they will deliver both domestic investment and also be more attractive for foreign investment. So what we're looking for now is for the market to continue an uptrend towards initially 3,100 and looking for some what's called consolidation. In other words, we move to 3,100 and sit around that level for several, several weeks or maybe a month or two before resuming the long-term uptrend. So the market has welcomed all of the initiatives. And they're well them not because they're a big bazooka, as we've talked about before, but because these initiatives are targeted at particular areas to satisfy particular needs and to resolve particular types of problems. That's very different from what China did in 2008, where we had arguably a bazooka effect that drove a whole range of factors with one single largely untargeted move in terms of infrastructure. This is more sophisticated, more developed, more targeted, and the market appreciates that. That's one of the reasons why it's moved so rapidly in the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Dario, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, go ahead, Bartram. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the reason I uh, disagree is that uh, this is the most uh, aggressive, uh, particularly financial package, is that uh, we have already seen that uh, many of those uh, uh, Wall Streets, uh, small and and big uh, around the world are really trying to see there is going to be a tumblous, uh, the uh, financial uh, opportunities in China. 
So uh, that's why we should say that uh, this meeting comes out with more of a holistic uh, health building, uh, building efforts instead of uh, a uh, large dosage of doping into the economy. So uh, therefore, uh, they really wanted to jack up a uh, windfall of uh, opportunities so that they can re really leverage and spe speculate on the Chinese financial market mm -hmm. instead of uh, offering firm commitment to grow with the Chinese economy. So that's, uh, I think that's the primary driver for his comments. And now, uh, you know, for China right now, be, uh, you know, if you look at the number of measures like, you know, opening completely the uh, manufacturer sector for foreign investment, uh, inviting more of the high tech firms to participate into the Chinese high quality development, etc. So therefore, uh, the uh, bubble uh, won't be created and speculative forces will be uh, somewhat disappointed uh, over uh, such sort of performance. I think now uh, a uh, correct and realistic recognition of what is going on, as many of our uh, friends uh, and colleagues uh, have been talking about, is something that's uh, very important instead of uh, creating a fantasy uh, for those uh, traders and speculators. Y yes. Um, uh, yeah, Radhika, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I just wanted to clarify one other thing while we're uh, talking about these issue of Western perceptions and so on. And that is that, you know, uh, this uh, matter of whether the Chinese uh, 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 fiscal, uh, monetary measures uh, are actually following some kind of a worldwide trend towards lower interest rates. I think another thing we have to remember is that in Western countries, in the United States, the lowering of interest rates in, in uh, just in this past uh, couple of weeks has actually not been, you know, of course, it is always justified in terms of, you know, economic growth and so on. But in reality, the lowering of interest rates was practically demanded by the asset markets. They are basically saying, unless you lower interest rates, we are going to have a crash. And remember, the West has been in a slow motion crash since uh, la uh, 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 spring of 2023, when Silicon Valley Bank burst. And there have been numerous problems in commercial real estate, in um, uh, even in the treasury market, in uh, private equity, all sorts of markets are suffering. And so essentially markets were saying the, to the Federal Reserve, if you don't give us a, 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 a lower interest rates now, we are going to have a real problem. And so the Federal Reserve has responded to that. And I would say that it may even come at the expense in the end of not being able to tame inflation because they, they you see, it's a long story, but basically they, what I'm saying is that the reason for reduction of interest rate there is completely different. In China, as we have been mentioning, the reasons for the reduction in the interest rates are, do have to do it, with doing it in a very measured way and targeting the credit to particular places, whether it is the property market, whether it is the uh, gov uh, local governments, which are, of course, in China, such an important actor in producing the economic growth that China produces. So I think that this is a completely different story. And I just wanted to get that in before we end. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, yes. If, if I may. Yeah, Yalian, please. If I may, I want yeah. to Yes, I would like to go back to that fiscal uh, policy aspect. And I think that if the two trillion special bond issues uh, is, is, is materialized, I think that would be tremendously helpful. Uh, One trillion for uh, consumption support. We know that, you know, the rich cities like Shanghai has already uh, announced the issuance of consumer vouchers to help to boost consumption. But I think, you know, this one trillion could be used in a much more targeted way uh, to really help the relatively poor um, and financial stress uh, governments uh, to support their local consumption. And another one trillion special bonds. And I'm really hoping this is going to help to, you know, shore up the local government's uh, coffer. Because as I just mentioned, a lot of local governments are facing uh, their cash, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the lack of cash, right? So when we look at the number in August, for example, fiscal spending as a country has reduced by 6.7%. So that is a very restrictive uh, uh, fiscal stance, and that is really not conducive um, for economic growth and recovery. And also, I think uh, it goes without saying for local governments, they still have a lot of bond issuance quota. 
As a matter of fact, um, the first seven months of this year, the local governments only used up about 54.5% um, of their um, special bond issuance quota, which is about 10 percentage points lower than the same period the last year. So again, this indicates that the local government debt issue has been mounting and some of the local government really needs some relief. Um, so then they can go ahead and finance some of the important public investments and also provide essential public services and pay their government um, uh, office, uh, officials and um, you know workers. And I think all of these are very important to stabilize jobs and income, as well as providing support for the local economies. Mm -hmm. So I think these fiscal expansion uh, would be really welcomed and very inducive and uh, uh, instrumental um, to rekindle the economy. Yeah, rekindle the now, economy. Please just, uh, allow me to disagree on that because uh, the uh, consumption does not really need to be stimulated because if you have uh, more of the buying capacity, you know what to decide. And uh, at the moment, it is not really the cash that's important, but it's the confidence. The consumption com uh, confidence lies in the stable job and probably higher paying job. And uh, also the confidence uh, lies also within the private sector uh, where it is not there yet uh, uh, because they need to have the firm uh, rule of law with regard to their property rights and with regard to their hiring, uh, hiring practices and also their tax, etc. cetera. So uh, therefore, uh, we can see that there's uh, a lot of money around, you know, look at the savings rate uh, of the bank and look at the uh, the, the, uh, the credit uh, liquidity that is uh, going on. Actually, uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, there uh, idly instead of going to the real economic growth. So these are real issues. So I think the government need really to focus on uh, how to, uh, you know, invigorate the structural uh, the uh, mobility of uh, uh, different type of resources, including capital, instead of simply, you know, uh, resorting to a, a very simplistic measure of uh, injecting money into the market. Mm -hmm. uh, of, of course, so yes, I, if I may, I would just want to yes, I yeah, would yeah. like to respond really quickly to this question. I totally agree. I think there are much better way to so-called stimulate consumption. Consumption is very difficult to directly stimulate, as you mentioned, it based on income, it based on the perception of wealth and also future, you know, jobs and income. So it is very difficult to stimulate. And that's why I, I said this, this uh, any stimulus to consumption or any sort of cash handout has to be very targeted. Um, mm -hmm. I think the government has just announced that they are going to provide some cash assistance to the low income families. And I think that is welcomed. Um, it's not just to sort of stimulate the consumption per se, but really to provide some you know, assistance to people who are needed and also in some ways to provide some sort of confidence boost, right? That the government is behind, the government will help uh, to get through some of the tough times. And again, August, the re retail sales growth is 2.1%. I think that is too low. And I think there's still room for that to grow. Uh, but again, I agree, there are definitely much better ways, but indirect ways um, to stimulate consumption, right? As in the Chinese saying, uh, instead of giving people fish, it's better to teach people fish. Yes. So providing the opportunities to participate in jobs and stable, stable income and also stimulate confidence is very important. And I totally agree with you. Agree with you. you know, the now mid, we're on the same page. It, it, yes, in, in, the mid, <laughs> it's, it's, in the middle of this year, actually, when you look at the outstanding bank deposits by households, it has gone up by 10% year over year. So you're right, many of the households do have the money to spend, but they, don't, they, they save it up and they leverage, they buy wealth management funds. But there are people, especially low income families, I think could get some help, help. Uh, as yes. far as cash handout is concerned. Right. It's really about yeah. how. Uh, with that, we come to the end for today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>